Hi everyone, it's Michael, and you'll have to forgive my voice. I'm a little bit under the weather today, so if it cuts in and out throughout the video, please just bear with me. Um, today I'm gonna be doing a repot video, which is so exciting because I don't think I've done one of these in years. But today I'm gonna be repotting my Corianthes Macrantha X Self. And this plant has quite unexpectedly done very, very well for me. It's bloomed twice. So I'm actually going to cut to some footage of this plant in bloom so you can see exactly what it looks like. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the plant. Unfortunately, the only footage I have of my Corianthes in bloom was taken from my Instagram story, which is why you're seeing this video in vertical format. At the time, I did not realize that the bloom duration on this was so brief, it only lasts about two to three days, so I never had an opportunity to film some more elaborate content. So having said that, let's go ahead and talk about the origin of this plant. It grows native to various places like Trinidad, Guiana, Suriname, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, and Brazil. In terms of its light preferences, it is said that this likes bright shade, but I find it tolerates a little bit of morning light quite well. In terms of its temperature preferences, it tends to favor warm to hot temperatures, but basically your domestic temperatures are going to be perfectly sufficient. And in terms of watering, this likes its moisture conditions to be quite damp. Without further lead in, let's just go ahead and jump in. Now you may have already noticed that I have my plants soaking in a bath of water. This is room temperature water. And I like to start most of my repots this way because what it does is it softens the potting medium. It makes it a bit easier to wrestle away from the roots so that you incur less damage throughout the process of the repot. So this has already been sitting in the water for about 15 minutes. So I think we're good to go ahead and start. Um, one of the other benefits of pre-soaking the plant in water is the healthy, viable roots tend to turn a shade of green, so you're aware of which ones are good and the ones that don't turn any color or perhaps just stay brown or black, um, those might be rotted. So that gives you a great indicator for where to cut if you need to cut away from the root system. So let's just go ahead and start the process. I'm gonna begin, how am I gonna do this? I think I need to get rid of these wires first. So um, I've got my toolkit right here. I actually put it in a nice little Lazy Susan. It makes things super easy. So I've already sterilized these, but I'll show you what that process looks like. Here are my clipping tools, and I also have some just good old fashioned rubbing alcohol. And what I'm gonna do is I like to just spritz them and then wipe them down. Now the funny thing that I've learned over my years as an orchid grower, I used to be super paranoid about this step, like, oh gosh, if I cut into anything without sterilizing first, it's definitely gonna cause an infection. And the reality is, is orchids are a lot hardier than we think they are. It's best practice to do it this way, but, um, for the most part, I think you would be fine. So having said that, I've just gone ahead and sterilized. Um, and now let's go ahead and work off the, it's so funny, I, I purchased it just like this and then I just kind of jimmy rigged it with some masking tape, which wasn't ideal. This has never been repotted as long as I've had it. So let me just go ahead and clip this away. And off it came. Great. And I also think this is gonna be really easy. Okay, beautiful. Wow. That is a very healthy root system. Look at that, you guys. Oh my goodness. Um, it has really, really kind of densely packed itself into the sphagnum moss that it has potted into. Um, it seems to really, really like the potting method that it was enjoying. Now, one of the things to know about the Corianthes is flower spikes grow straight down and sometimes they will grow into the container, which is why it's best practice to pot them in something slatted or something that has openings so that the flower spike can find its way out. So I'm actually gonna be using this little four inch basket today. It has lots of places and opportunities for the flower spike to emerge. So that's what we're gonna do. Now I'm gonna move this jacuzzi and I'm going to just begin working my way through the roots and getting rid of anything that I think isn't necessary. Now, something to know about the Corianthes is they tend to be very sensitive to sour medium. So if it's been sitting in sphagnum moss that is really just decomposing and starting to disintegrate, the plant is not gonna like it. It can really adversely impact its development. So that's why it's so important to periodically repot, but also this seems to be really healthy. I just don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna incur damage where I don't have to. Now, one of the reasons that I'm repotting at the time that I am is because I see this beautiful new growth coming in. And this new growth has a couple new leads in terms of its root growth and development. So it's a good opportunity because this plant is going to acclimate really nicely with its new root system and its new growth into the new container. So honestly, this root system is so well established and so healthy and vigorous that I really don't wanna mess with it too much by digging too deeply into it. So what I am gonna do is I'm gonna take my clipper tool and I'm gonna work my way and remove all of this excess debris, all of the roots that I know to not be viable from the surface, and then we will just come back.
Now, one of the things I've included in my toolkit is these lovely little tweezers. So I'm gonna try to do a little bit more cleanup right in the crown of the plant, but I don't wanna use my fingers because they are clunky and liable to cause damage. So I'm just gonna get in there with these precision tweezers and start pulling out little bits and chunks of sphagnum moss. All right, my friends, it's about as cleaned up as it's gonna get. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clear off my workspace and then I'm gonna come back so we can treat this with hydrogen peroxide. So I've gotten everything cleaned up and what I'm gonna do now is just give the entire plant a good spritz with hydrogen peroxide. And the reason we do this is if there's any hitchhikers that may have come in on your plant, whether that's snails or bugs of some variety, it helps to just kind of eradicate any of those problems. Now what I'm gonna use is this spray bottle of hydrogen peroxide. I get this on Amazon. I like it because it's in an opaque bottle. It already comes with a spray head attached to it and you can refill it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put it right over my bowl and then I'm gonna give the entire plant a little spray. The funny thing about what I'm doing right now is it's kind of too little too late. This plant has been in my collection for quite some time. So if there were hitchhikers, they've been a part of my family for quite some time. But I'm just showing you what best practice is. I'm just gonna go ahead and treat the entire plant. I'm even gonna get right into the crown of the plant. Now during a repot, the only places that I really try to avoid spraying or getting moisture into are new growths or places that I don't feel like a steady stream of moving air will access easily because orchids can recover quite nicely from moisture. You know, people are really afraid of getting their plants wet because they're like, oh, that'll cause bacterial rot, which is a reasonable concern. However, if you have a strong source of steady moving air, it'll dry up quickly because that's what happens in nature. But in tiny, tiny little crevices like this new growth, you don't want to get it in there because the, the flowing air can't get inside of it. So I'm just going to avoid that area specifically. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a timer and then we'll come back to this in about 10 minutes. Okay, Google, set a timer for 10 minutes. Sure, 10 minutes, starting now. 10 minutes is up, so I'm gonna go ahead and give the plant a quick rinse with just room temperature water and we will come back. So I've given the plant a good rinse with water. And the one thing that I wanna point out is that after treating with hydrogen peroxide, you wanna avoid fertilizing for a period of a week to two weeks. Now the reason that is, is the hydrogen peroxide is killing bacteria, both good and bad. So there are some symbionts, some mutually beneficial bacteria that exist on the root system that help it to process and metabolize nutrients. And you have just effectively killed them. So you really have to give them an opportunity to repopulate. Think of it this way, if you were to skin your knee, yes, you might want to apply a body lotion to nourish and feed your skin, but you wouldn't put body lotion directly in an open wound. So you want to give those wounds time to heal, to close up before you start feeding with the nutrient solution. So having said that, let's go ahead and move forward with the next step. I've got my basket right here, and I think that this is going to work out pretty perfectly. So I'm just going to take this plant almost exactly as it is and I am just going to place it in the dead center of the basket. Now what's lovely about this is the roots are gonna compact down just a little bit, but it has plenty of space to grow down and pendant. So I'm gonna reach for my good old fashioned, it's super moss from Santa Barbara, California. Now you'll notice that I'm using it dry. I'm actually going to fill the space around the plant using dry sphagnum moss. And it took me a while to figure it out, but it's always best practice to use the sphagnum moss dry because if you apply it or place it when it's wet, you run the risk of overpacking the container and then you suffocate the root system. If you do it when the sphagnum moss is dry and then wet the container, the sphagnum moss will expand and maintain that beautiful airiness that allows this epiphyte to continue to grow and breathe. So sphagnum moss has actually proven to be a phenomenal incubator for this plant. It seems to really, really like it. It doesn't, you know, struggle against it. And the only real risk here is that the sphagnum moss will eventually break down and deteriorate. But one of the reasons I love potting into baskets of this kind is because it is slatted. As these things start to break down, the sphagnum moss just kind of falls out around the plant. And in theory, the root system will begin to anchor to the actual wooden container itself. And that's precisely what I'm looking for. So that's just kind of my internal dialogue. That's what I'm hoping will happen. And that's why I'm moving forward this way. Now, one really important piece of this equation is how I'm going to place this plant. Because you see this new growth, you don't wanna block it. And especially because I'm gonna be attaching cables to suspend this, you don't want the new growth to be constantly butting heads with the cable or to be constantly at odds with it because you run the risk of breakage. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to kind of trace the path of the new growth, which is coming in this way. So what I'm gonna do is make sure that it goes into a place where it is unobstructed for growth. So you can see I'm actually taking this shape here, which is a diamond, and I'm going to apply it in the square. Instead of putting it perfectly squared, I'm going to just center it. So that new growth is coming in right along the center and not anywhere near where the cables or the suspenders will be. 
So now that I've showed you that, we can go ahead and fill with sphagnum moss around the negative spaces. So just to show you what I've done, I've gone ahead and used that dry sphagnum moss to pack all of the corners surrounding the plant. And if I shake my Corianthes, you can see it's very sturdy in the container. It's very secure, but it also has room to grow. It has room to breathe and tons and tons of aeration. So with that, I can go ahead and move forward with attaching the hanging apparatus. And to do that, I purchased this magical little thing off of Amazon. I will link the product below, but essentially it's just a carabiner with four separate wires hanging and then these little clips. Now I am so done with those wire hanger like apparatuses. They are so obnoxious. They are so imprecise. They just drive me crazy. It makes me feel like Faye Dunaway in Mommy Dearest. I'm like, no, no wire hangers. So I'm gonna go ahead and begin the process of attaching these four to each corner. Look how lovely and happily situated and symmetrical this is. I am very, very pleased with how this came out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to go ahead and hang this in a Western facing exposure. Now it is said that this plant prefers bright shade, but per my game changers of 2019 video, most of your plants can take more light than you think so long as you acclimate them progressively to that elevated light. And this just grows so much better for me when it has a little bit of contact with the sun. So I'm gonna go ahead and hang this in my Western facing exposure. But before I do that, I'm just gonna go ahead and give this a quick soak in plain water just to go ahead and moisten that dry sphagnum moss, allow it to expand before I put it in its new home. And with that, that's pretty much it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. It has been so long since I've done a repot video. As always, thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with me. If you have any questions, concerns, or feedback, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. Be sure to support one another in the comment section because I am so seldom available to do so. Don't forget to click subscribe and have a beautiful rest of your day. Bye guys.